Good afternoon. Welcome to today's webinar, Human Factors Issues in Automobile Accident Cases. During this program, the presenter will provide an overview of the discipline of human factors and how it applies to forensic matters, a detailed discussion of the human factors issues that are relevant to automobile cases, including particularly the factors that affect reaction time and visibility. And finally, examples of automobile cases where human factors expertise has been applied. The presenter for today's program is Dr. Stephen Wilcox. Dr. Wilcox is a principal and founder of Design Science Philadelphia, a 25-person firm that specializes in human factors consulting for major corporations, primarily to support the development of products and equipment. Dr. Wilcox is a member of the Industrial Designers Society of America Academy of Fellows. He has served as the Vice President and member of the IDSA Board of Directors and Chair of the IDSA Human Factors Professional Interest Section. He also serves on the Human Factors Engineering Committee, the Association for the Advancement of Medical Instrumentation, the Advisory Board of the Carnegie Mellon University School of Design. Dr. Wilcox holds a Bachelor of Science in Psychology and Anthropology from Tulane University, a PhD in Experimental Psychology from Penn State, and a Certificate in Business Administration from the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania. Dr. Wilcox chaired the 2000 IDSA National Conference in New Orleans and co-chaired the Include 2009 Conference on Inclusive Design at the Royal College of Art in London. He has won design awards from IDSA and from the International Design Magazine, guest edited the journal Innovation several times, and serves as a judge for a number of product design award competitions. He has also given many invited addresses to various organizations and has published more than 65 articles and book chapters. Dr. Wilcox has served as an expert witness in the area of human factors and hundreds of legal, legal matters for both plaintiff and defense attorneys. Dr. Wilcox has asked that we take questions throughout today's program. If you have a question for the presenter, please use the chat or Q&A feature found on the right-hand side of the screen to submit your questions, and we will get to them as quickly as we can. Tomorrow morning, I'll send out an email with a link to the archive recording of this program. We do ask that you take time to fill out the survey that will appear on your screen when today's webinar is over. I now invite you to sit back, relax, and enjoy. I'm going to turn the presentation over to our distinguished guest, Dr. Stephen Wilcox. Steve, the program is all yours. Okay. Thanks very much, Matt. Uh, as Matt said, I'm I'm happy to take questions throughout the course of the presentation. It's kind of funny not to be able to hear or see any of the uh, any of the audience. Uh, at any rate, what I, as Matt said, what I would like to do here is I'd like to uh, first give an introduction to human factors uh, in, in general, and then I'll focus specifically on how it applies to automobile cases. All right, so let's get started. So first of all, what is human factors? This is the way it's typically defined within our field, the application of knowledge about human beings to the design and evaluation of the things that human beings use. Uh, so another way to think about it is we're experts on human capabilities, limitations, and tendencies. Almost everything we know about humans falls into one of those three categories. Uh, and, and it's an, another way to think of it is that human factors is an applied science, uh, like an the, like an engineering uh, versus physics. What engineering is to physics, perhaps psychology is, uh, or human factors is to psychology and related uh, social science disciplines. Uh, so let's talk about what it applies to. Uh, um, so, and now I'm not specifically talking about forensic matters, although that would certainly be included. But this is what the kinds of problems that human factors people work on. First, the design of products and equipment. So there are consumer products, uh, issues like the old, uh, how, do you, uh, how do you figure out which burn control 
affects what, what burner. We work on problems like that. So consumer products, uh, commercial equipment, office furniture, for example, um, and then industrial products. Uh, we work with engineers and industrial designers on making machines safe and easy to use and efficient and so on. Uh, next is the application to information. So uh, we work on all sorts of information-related problems. For example, we work on the design of instruction manuals. Um, we design warnings and signage. Uh, and we increasingly work on the design of software user interfaces. Um, so, and again, in these cases, we human factors people work typically with various categories of designers. In this area, for example, user interface design, we take our knowledge about humans and we and we put that together with usually uh, work together with computer science professionals and uh, so-called interaction design. Um, and then finally is the application to systems, and this is the general category that we're going to talk about today. So that uh, the application to architecture, for example, there's a uh, there's a body of information, uh, human factors information about how to make a stairway safe, uh, as an example, uh, and the workplace, um, how to design jobs so that they're safe and won't cause user uh, overuse injuries, uh, and what have you. And then finally, highways and driving. That's what we're going to be talking about. So in all of these areas, one thing I want to I want to um, mention is that there is a body of literature, of technical literature on all these subjects. And uh, it's published in journals like Applied Ergonomics and the Human Factors Journal and so on. So when we're working on for instance problems we're drawing on the, that kind of published typically drawing on that kind of published uh, information as well as general information from psychology and what have you so human factors people like me work on problems like where do you locate the signs on the highway and what should they say and how large should the text be and so on uh, okay so uh, the underlying knowledge about human beings that we apply in human factors comes primarily from these disciplines. It comes from experimental psychology, uh, and I'm going to talk about some of that kind of information in a minute. Uh, it comes from anthropology, particularly when the issues have to do with cultural or ethnic differences. Uh, it comes from the biological sciences, particularly when issues have to do with the physical part of human factors that we're going to talk about in a minute, uh, as opposed to the cognitive part of human factors. Um, and nowadays, there is the uh, more and more of the information that we rely on comes from the discipline of human factors itself, which is a growing applied form of uh, applied uh, social science, as I mentioned. And then finally. There's a tradition within industrial engineering uh, that has to do with design of the workplace and what have you. Um, so let's talk about some of the underlying information that we, that this is what we have uh, books and journals and libraries full of uh, information about. So first of all is the shape and size of the body. Um, the, we, we know about the dimensions of the various components of the body. We know about height uh, and so on and so forth. That's a discipline called anthropometry that actually grew, grew out of physical anthropology. Um, and then that's kind of, you can sort of think of anthropometry as the static um, study of human, human shape and size. The dynamic study of humans is a discipline called biomechanics. So the kinds of things that end up being relevant are strength. Uh, so was a given lever appropriate in terms of the force it required, for example? Posture, uh, movement. Uh, we know about the proper range of motion of the various joints and so on and so forth. Um, now, I've, I pulled out just a few kind of very specific little facts that have I've relied upon over the years in various uh, legal matters that 
that I've I've uh, served as an expert on. So here's an example. So asymmetrical postures are associated with overuse injuries. So if there's a job that entails that is designed in such a way that requires people to to uh, be in these kinds of asymmetrical um, postures where they're not where their spine isn't more or less vertical for periods of time, it's liable to lead to injury. Here's another one. Uh, the hand isn't really designed to to take pressure on the back side or the top side. Uh, so um, one uh, implication for this is when you close scissors, you're fine because the pressure is on the palm side. When you open scissors, that's really not so great. So there, there's a whole tradition, or there have been a number of uh, overuse uh, injuries over the years from that kind of thing. By the way, the the, the anatomy of the hand is such that the uh, blood vessels and the nerves um, through evolutionary time have migrated to the top of the hand to allow you to put lots of pressure on the palm side. That's what it's designed for. So when you do this, like when you're opening a pair of scissors, you're really doing something that's that's not great uh, for for the hand. Um, here's another example: is that uh, we know eye height. Uh, this often comes up, you know, in questions like, did the could the person see into that bin, or uh, when they're driving. Being, where was their eye relative to the object that they ran into or what have you? And so uh, the, we know about the distribution of eye heights. It's something that's, uh, that's studied within this field I mentioned before, anthropometry. Okay, so the, uh, here's another, uh, uh, here's other kinds of information that we have access to and that we study. So vision and hearing uh, are um, the two areas are collectively called uh, perception and the psychology of perception. So I'm going to be talking specifically about vision in a minute because that often comes up in legal matters, but also we know a lot about uh, the other senses as well, how they work. What? So let's take in the case of hearing, um, how loud does something have to be and what frequency does it have to be to be heard and, and how do you... Um, hear something above the background noise, and so on and so forth. Uh, so those are those are issues related to hearing that come out of our literature, our human factors literature, as well as the vision issues that I'm going to talk about in a minute. Um, the uh, another thing is memory. This often comes up in the design of procedures and and uh, various thing design problems that we work on. Is we want to make something easy to remember. And so there's a there's a lot of information available about how you make something memorable or less memorable, what people tend to remember or not remember under various circumstances. Another one, and of course, that you can imagine that this is important is what are what kinds of errors that people tend to make. What we try to do as as designers uh, is we try to we try to assure that. The likelihood of error is as small as possible. That's what how I spend much of my work uh, in on the design side of things. Uh, attention is another one. What do people attend to? How many things can you attend to at any given time? Uh, when you're attending to one thing, how does it affect the ability to notice something else? That that whole kind of area is called uh, this, called the psychology of attention. Fatigue's another one. How do people change? And how does their conduct and behavior change uh, when they get fatigued? What circumstances cause people to fall asleep or to stay awake? Um, and uh, just in general, there are all kinds of behavioral tendencies. Um, we know a lot about what people tend to do in what circumstances, and we take advantage of that in designing systems that are that are safe and easy to use. Um, and finally, the study of arousal is another, it's an interesting one, and it, at least um, when I have my design hat on, I kind of think of the, the people we're designing for as falling into three categories. There's the, 
the normal person, quote unquote, uh, that is right here in the middle. Uh, but down at the bottom is the person that's bored, that's done doing the same repetitive task over and over. Then you're subject to this phenomenon that we call habituation, and then it changes the kind of way you respond to the environment. At this, uh, on the other end of the continu uh, continuum is panic. And uh, when a person is in a panic state, which is very, um, very definable uh, physiologically, it's when you have epinephrine, the, the um, the substance epinephrine flooding into your uh, bloodstream, and it causes very predictable changes. It causes people to revert to their most instinctive or habitual forms of behavior, and it causes uh, vision to to, uh, to essentially focus just on the center of the visual field. You you lose your peripheral vision, relatively speaking, in a panic state. So sometimes, you know, when we look at uh, when we're looking at accidents, um, the explanation for something that otherwise doesn't make sense is that the person was in this panic state, so they didn't act as you would in, in cold blood. Okay, so let's uh, let's um, uh, talk a little bit, bit more about some of these cognitive issues. So these are it. what I've done here is I've kind of put together some some facts that seem to come up over and over in legal matters, particularly legal matters that involve uh, automobile accidents. Um, so here's an important one, and this one I, I, it probably comes up more than anything else, and that is that we only have clear vision in the center of the visual field, and it's a fairly small area. It's only about 3%. Imagine 3% of of uh, the, uh, or I'm sorry, three degrees, and we kind of think of this as imagine a 360 degree circle uh, centered around the head, and so that's what we mean by that's how degrees are defined, and this is this notion that we call the visual field, and you really only have clear vision in about the center th three degrees of the vision. So uh, you then take a photograph of, uh, so when you take a photograph of something, you show it, but something, well, wasn't this obvious? Couldn't you see it? Well, the, uh, often the answer is, well, you could have seen it if it was in the center of your visual field. But things get very blurry the farther you get out to the so-called periphery. So here's the eye, and this is uh, this notion of the visual field. So the farther you get from central vision, the blurrier things get, or to get a little more technical, the less acuity you have, uh, the farther you are in peripheral vision. Um, here's another one, another kind of cognitive uh, issue, and there's this thing that often um, comes up. It seems to have um, gotten into the popular culture, this notion of uh, this traumatic memory loss. Uh, some traumatic event happens and you can't remember it because it's so horrifying and frightening or what have you, that you, quote, repress the memory. This goes back to Sigmund Freud, in fact, in the late 19th century. Well, it turns out that now that it's been studied in some depth, there is no such thing. There's no such thing as the loss of memory in that way of a traumatic event. However, uh, it turns out that a, a traumatic event event can mask, so to speak, your memory of surrounding events, uh, of events that come before and after. So, for example, a person that is in a uh, in an automobile collision may not remember that they just ran that stop sign a few seconds before, or whatever. They may not remember what they what they passed before. And they may not remember it even more than they would otherwise because this traumatic event of the collision itself has a tendency to mask surrounding events. Um, and I talked a little bit about arousal um, and, uh, and this, uh, this concept of tunnel vision. And there's a lot of evidence for that, um, that in arous high arousal states, so in automobile cases, this you can imagine how this plays out. When uh, you're on the verge of a collision, your conduct can be uh, undermined by this loss of peripheral vision if something now comes 
from um, the side that you have to immediately react to, uh, that that can be more difficult to do in a panic state, for example. Um, okay, so just a little bit more about human factors. Uh, when, when human factors people are not working on on uh, these uh, legal matters, what we typically do is we work as part of an interdisciplinary team and we feed information into the design process having to do with human beings. So that's, and, and you know, I think it's fair to say that's that's really what human factors, where it came from and what it's all about. And uh, the application to forensic matters is an offshoot of, of that human factors. Um, Here's a little hist quick history. Um, it's been around for a long time. It, uh, industrial designers were really the inventors of the discipline of human factors. When they were working on, uh, as, as that field of product design evolved, uh, the uh, designers recognized that they could do a better job if they knew more about the people that were going to be using their devices. So uh, that's that's kind of the very early beginnings of of uh, human factors in the 1930s. Uh, then in World War uh, II, the, uh, the Army recognized that they had a real problem of, uh, um, of injuries associated with uh, errors of, uh, in weapon systems, particularly aircraft, uh, so that, uh, the, the, there was the belief that we needed to know more about the users of weapons systems, uh, including, of course, aircraft. So the Army drafted every experimental psychologist it could find and put them to work on this kind of problem. And that's the modern, uh, so so the modern field of human factors really got a big boost uh, at that time in World War II. And in that group, after the war, the group that had been working in, in the military mostly founded the Human Factors Society, originally called the Human Factors Society in the 1950s, now called the Human Factors and Ergonomics Society. Um, in the 60s, it was still primarily used in the military. Um, there's some so-called mil specs that, that require human factors applications, for example. So uh, there were, uh, it was heavily, um, the balance was heavily tipped toward the military in the 60s. In the 70s is when it started evolving more into civilian applications. Uh, initially, primarily the workplace, uh, the area called workplace ergonomics, which is to define uh, jobs, uh, particularly back in the in manufacturing uh, uh, days when the U.S. actually had manufacturing, uh, to make assembly lines uh, less error-inducing and what have you. Um, so... Uh, that was one of the original applications. And then in the 80s was really when it started spreading to everything else, when, when human factors started working in signage design and highway design and product design and and uh, what have you. Uh, oh, just a little something about credentials. Uh, certainly you want degrees in psychology, human factors-related fields. One of the things I go through, I'm, my, my degrees in psychology is, I go through a rigmarole always uh, if when I testify. Oh, but you don't have a degree in human factors. And it turns out that most of the members of the Human Factors Society don't, uh, particularly us older older guys, uh, because human factors as a separate discipline has been uh, is a relatively new thing. So the younger people often do have degrees in human factors per se, but uh, the majority of the members of the Human Factors Society remain uh, coming from psychology or a related field. Uh, another is work experience. Now, this is, call me biased, but at least I personally am skeptical of people who have never had any real work experience. I, I've the, the opinions that I see from uh, people who have only served as experts right out of school, uh, I find uh, often, at least in my opinion, and often lack validity because they just don't understand uh, the constraints of, of actual application of human factors. Uh, of course, they uh, human factors person should be a member of HFES, the Human Factors and Ergonomic Society. And finally, there's this certification uh, business. There's a group that's been certifying. There's a I think you 
you get certified as a certified human factors professional or something like that. Uh, it's never been endorsed by the Human Factors and Ergonomic Society. And last I looked, only about one in five acting human factors professionals had been certified. So uh, it's not something that I personally have done. Uh, but And uh, so, of course, I'm going to say it's not necessary, but uh, that's just something to be aware of. Uh, okay, now let's talk specifically about uh, about automobile cases. Um, the the sort of core question or the central question that seems to come up that human factors applies to is this. Whose fault was the collision? It all really seems, all of these cases really seem to boil down to that. Um, was the person that did the colliding, uh, if it was a... or the others, or perhaps both, or perhaps nobody's. Uh, so that, that's kind of like, that, that's sort of what I'm thinking of when in talking about these various issues. Okay, so here are the key, here are the, these are, are issues that come up over and over, and these are the often the kinds of things that I find myself testifying about in these human factors cases. First of all, there's the notion of the normal range. So here's a normal curve. So uh, no matter what the human characteristic is, it seems to pattern as a normal curve in the population. So let's uh, uh, what we have here uh, is the number of uh, standard deviations from the mean, the amount of uh, variability. And what we have here is some measure, whatever it is. So let's say this is uh, reaction time. It's going to pattern something like this. So you'll see that, you know, here's a, let's call this, for purposes of discussion, let's say uh, this is a really fast reaction time. This is maybe half a second. And this is a relatively slow reaction time on the right, maybe three seconds uh, for in a given set of circumstances. So you're going to find that, the, uh, you know, the largest number of people uh, respond somewhere in between a few people respond really quickly, and a few people respond really slowly. Uh, and that's true of anything. It's, it's, it's true of visual acuity. It's true of hearing. It's true of just about every um, human characteristic. So that's important to know, uh, and, and it's important to remember, because often what happens is the sort of naive um, way of looking at it is, well, how long does it, the question I I'm often asked, for example, is how long does it take a person to react? Or at what distance should they have seen that person, you know, that, that event or, or uh, whatever? And I always say, well, there's going to be a natural range of uh, it's going to probably pattern as a normal distribution. There's not one answer to that. There's going to be a range of responses. And so if a person responds in the middle, then we can say, all right, well, that's a fairly typical response. You can't really say that there was anything wrong with it. What becomes more problematical is, let's call it, let's, in the, my example of reaction time, what happens when it's out here some, on the right somewhere? What happens if they responded um, slower than most people, but still within, like, the maybe the middle 50% or even the middle 80%? Um, what do we say about that? Is it their fault because they responded more slowly than most people? I don't think that's a that's a fair way to think about it. But whatever we decide, um, it's, it's important to remember that we have this distribution of of responses um, in the population. Uh, oh, just to go back to that for a second, one thing that we can often calculate those where in our expected distribution did the response of a given person at a given time fall, and that can at least help us shed light on what what's going on. Uh, Excuse me, uh, related, Dr. Wilcox, we have a question yes. about sure. the normal range here from Matthew who asks, um, the yeah, legal standard go, usually back to that down slide. to foreseeability and the reasonable man. Would the expert, would you equate the normal curve with a reasonable person? Is typical equated 
limited to reasonable, or is it more of a legal conclusion? Well, no, it's I, I, it, it's one of these places where the law and and the the science uh, are kind of stirred up in a fairly complicated way. Now, given that, okay, so let me go back to my example. Let's suppose that my minus three here represents responding the fastest anybody's ever responded uh, to a car stopping in front of about half a second. And suppose the, the, the positive three out here represents responding in about three seconds. Okay, now what are we going to call the normal man? That's the question. Are we going to call the normal man, say, from here to here, the middle 90%? Does that all count? One thing that we certainly, I don't think it seems at all reasonable, is to say the person that is slower than average, somebody right here, suppose they, these are percentiles, so suppose somebody responds as the 51st percentile. Are we going to say that's not normal because it's high, it's slower than the, the median or, or, the, or the mean or average? Uh, so it's, it's a complicated question, and I, I guess, I guess the the fairest way, or the way that we in human factors tend to think of it, is that um, if there's, I'm going to talk about this in in just a minute. If there's no affirmative evidence of negligence, then it doesn't seem reasonable to fault people for responding um, somewhere in this normal curve if they're not an outlier. On the other hand, if they're if they're you know way out here somewhere and they're responding dramatically slower. Uh, than than what we know uh, should happen. Then I think then it's fair to say, well, there was something wrong with them. Uh, and and uh, and and even if we don't have evidence, uh, affirmative evidence of some kind of negligence. So uh, if if you want me to follow up on that question, go ahead. I just send another <laughs> note. I hope I answered uh, it to your satisfaction. Uh, but now, related to the business of the normal range, uh, is this difference, and I think this is an important difference for us in human factors, that um, sometimes the rest of the world doesn't quite seem to pay attention to. And that is natural limitations versus conscious choices. And I'll, let me give you an example. Um, a conscious choice is where someone decides to drive a home after they've had X amount of alcohol. So that's a that's a conscious choice. And you can say, well, you know, if the blood alcohol level was too high, we can say, well, that was a choice they made, and they can we can therefore fault them. However, suppose we have a person that just tends to have a slower reaction time. You know, say most of the population responds in one second. They tend to respond in two seconds. Now, this is a natural limitation that that person has, but can we fault them for that? And I I, I think that often I, I see these arguments, uh, it, frankly, typically made by by accident reconstructionists uh, or, or engineers who say, oh, it's his fault he responded more slowly than my calculations say that he should have or she should have. And uh, we in human factors are really skeptical of that view, way to look at it because, um, that, you know, how can you say that it's, if you just have a natural tendency to respond more slowly that it's your fault? At least you can't say it's your fault in the same way that you can say it's your fault if you decide to drive home with a BAL of a point two zero. Uh So that's, a, that's an issue that we often struggle with and often uh, comes up in these, in these kinds of uh, – in these cases, in these automobile cases. Um, and this is related to get to that, and that's affirmative evidence of negligence. And that's something we're, we're always looking for. So there's the person that responds more slowly than the general population. And then there's a person that was talking on their cell phone. Uh, so those are very different. And um, one of the things that I often see and this is, again, I often hear it or see it from experts who are not experts, from other experts who are not experts in human factors. So the, uh, I'll often see these reports written by engineers, for example, mechanical engineers, say, 
uh, and they'll say, uh, um, well, the person was obviously not paying attention. And so the, but, but you'll seldom, I think, you'll seldom see a legitimate uh, human factors person give that kind of an explanation. Because what's the evidence for it? The evidence for, quote, not paying attention nine times out of ten, or maybe 99 out of 100, is the very accident it purports to explain. So a person has a collision, and you say, why did they have the collision? Well, they had it because they weren't paying attention. Well, how do you know they weren't paying attention? Well, because they had the accident. So it's a completely circular form of reasoning. Uh, so what, what we're always looking for is some kind of affirmative evidence. Um, at least we tend, we human factors people tend to be um, very fine explanations like the, the accident happened because the person, quote, wasn't paying attention, uh, really problematical. On the other hand, as I say, if they were fiddling with their radio or talking on their cell phone or, or what have you, that's a whole different matter. Um, here's another one, conscious versus unconscious conduct. And uh, this is a this is a hard one because you got a person driving down the the road and something happens, and the the way that people do physical tasks is largely unconscious. And so, what is obvious when you're doing something in that kind of relatively unconscious manner, uh, and and what's apparent to you and noticeable and so on. Uh, when you're scrutinizing it, that is, when you're fully conscious of it, are very different. And so uh, the, the way this comes off and comes up is you'll have a photograph of a stop sign, and uh, the attorney will show the stops, the, the photograph of the stop sign to the jury and say, look at how obvious this was. And when you're... But, but now the jury attention has been drawn to it. And of course, when your attention has been drawn to it and you're conscious of it in that way, of course it's going to be obvious. The question is, and often the question is, but was it obvious when you were driving down the road in that relatively unconscious manner that we drive down the road? Uh, and, and so this is a debate or an issue that we human factors people often uh, struggle with and are, are involved in. I think there's a there's a bias toward thinking that what everything that one does is fully conscious, and that's simply not true. Um, and related in turn to that is this notion of expected versus une unexpected events. The difference is huge. Uh, expectations are, if there's one thing that affects your ability to see something and your ability to react, to it, it's how much you expect it, and so that's a that's another one is that what the response to something may seem um, completely illogical or or inappropriate or what have you, sitting in cold blood and knowing the facts and knowing what happened after the case. On the other hand, when you're in the situation that's, uh, and you don't expect something to take place. Uh, your response to it is very different. And it's really hard to unring that bell. That is to put yourself back in the framework of the person who didn't expect something to see how they would look at it. Uh, it's a very difficult thing to do, but I think people um, tend to, they tend to uh, overestimate the, uh, the ability to respond to something appropriately when you you don't expect it in the first place. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a minute. And here's another one. This comes up all the time. So let's take a, an example of where you've got some uh, you've got some odd situation. Uh, you've got a a, uh, a stop uh, a stop sign that's uh, um, th that is difficult to see. Say. Um, to say that the stop sign was difficult to see is not to say that it will be difficult for everybody. It's kind of back to that normal distribution concept. So all the time, you know, let's say, um, or here's another one, a, a truck stops on the, on the um, 
uh, on a divided uh, highway. And, uh, and the evidence indicates that four cars uh, were behind it, four saw that it was stopped and avoided it, and the fifth hit it. And so I can't tell you how many times I've heard the logic, well, wait a minute, the, fir- the fact that the first four people avoided the, the stop truck proves that the fifth person who hit it must be negligent. And the the answer that we would give, we human factors people would give, well, is that no, there, there's going to be a range of distribution of people's ability to see it and what have you. And just because somebody else saw it doesn't mean, doesn't make it per se negligence that somebody didn't. There's always going to be variability within the population. So, yeah, if 10,000 people uh, saw it and one person didn't, then I think that it would be fair to to ask why, uh, but if two or three people saw it or one person saw it and another didn't, that doesn't per se prove that the person who didn't see it uh, was in the wrong or, or somehow negligent. Um, okay, so here's, uh, again, these are issues that come up in these cases. Um, so... This is um, uh, particularly the the two things, the two uh, um, groups of issues that come up the most are vision and uh, reaction time. So let me let me talk about those. Uh, so this is the concept of looming here. So this imagine this uh, person coming up to a truck from the rear, and then what is being Represented here is the uh, the so-called retinal image. So when you, you when you look at something, you're, you're looking at something that has this height. It's projected on the back of the eye. So here's the lens of the eye. Here are the light rays, and the lens projects that image on the back of the eye, the so-called retina. And so as you move forward towards something, it's retinal size, the size on the retina, grows. So you get this looming phenomenon. It moves from something like this to something like this as you move forward. Now, when you're approaching something from the rear, particularly at night, that is the primary and sometimes the only visual cue available. So the question that often comes up is, why didn't you see that stop truck? We'll talk about that in a minute. And the, the the way to address the question is, well, um, the only cue you had was this looming. At what distance has that become significant enough to allow you to see unambiguously that it stopped as opposed to moving? What happens in these cases is typically is people, um, they see that the truck's there, but they don't recognize until it's too late that it's, it's stopped. Stopped. Uh, Here's just another basic principle is that the ability to see something is related to the amount of visual contrast. So that here, if we have uh, a line, well, just to give an example, so this line at the top of my thing right here contrasts pretty, pretty significantly with its background. So I can see that pretty easily. Although in here, this gradual gray, uh, that is posing a lot less contrast. Or this difference here with this line from there to there, that's low contrast. And so, but the the, the principle here is that, that, that it's contrast that allows you to see something. So the amount of contrast uh, is often one of the key issues in someone's ability to see something. Um, we talked about expert expectations. I probably don't, don't need to go uh, back into that, but the, the the basic principle is that the ability to see something and not misperceive it is highly related to how expected it is. The more unexpected something is, which is to say the more unusual it is, the less ability you have to accurately perceive it. Here's another interesting one. This is called the Mandelbaum effect. It's a phenomenon, and there are explanations that we could go into uh, for why we we know in great detail why this is, 
but I don't have time to go through all the details. But the point is, if you uh, let me put it this way: if you stand, if you're looking through a screen, through a window with a screen, if you move forward and back, you can try this at home after we're done. If you move forward and back, you'll find there's a distance at which you cannot defocus the screen. The screen itself essentially keeps you from being able to see through it. And everybody, each individual has a particular distance uh, at which this phenomenon takes place. It's called the Mandelbaum effect. Well, it turns out for the average person, it's just about the distance of the windshield from your eye. So that is uh, sometimes one of the key um, elements in these night driving automobile accident cases is that someone the 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 phenomenon is car coming the other way the glare uh from the is picked up by the windshield the windshield's right about at the mandelbaum effect for the driver and so they essentially lose their ability to see through the windshield by the way the cure for that is uh special glasses for driving at night that uh, it push your focal point out beyond the windshield. Uh, talked about central and peripheral vision. So here's the here's the eye. I talked about how the light rays come in and they fall on the retina. And uh, here's a a kind of map of what the retina looks like. We have these things. If you if you took uh, Psych 101, you, you may remember rods and cones. This is daytime vision here. This is the center of the retina, so the light coming right from the so this is a blow up of what's here on the uh, on the back of the eye of the retina. Uh so that this shows by the way why we can only see uh in the middle with real detailed acuity, and that's because the cones are are distributed uh much more densely in the middle. Uh, but this is interesting, what happens at night. So these cones fade out at night. There's a chemical transformation that takes place, and the rods take over. And what happens there is uh, you lose some acuity, but look at the distribution of the rods. You actually have a sort of blind spot in the middle of the visual field at night, and you actually have better vision somewhat to the side. Speaking of which, that's the other thing that often comes up is dark adaptation. Uh, people think dark adaptation has something to do with the pupil. It doesn't. It's a chemical transformation in the retina. To go back for a second, uh, the chemical transformation in the retina here, which causes this uh, change from the use of the cones to the use of the rods for night vision. And as you probably have noticed, uh, you don't have color vision at night. The rods do, do not allow color vision. Uh, here's time, and here's essentially sensitivity or the amount of light it takes to see something. And this is what takes, this is how it, it, it uh, changes with time. So you get this fairly rapid change when the, this is um, when light, you go from light to dark. So you walk into the movie theater and there's this fairly quick drop at about 10 minutes, but then there's even a slower drop to full sensitivity at about 30 minutes. The, the bottom line is it, it, there's a huge difference between night driving, uh, if you've been driving for a while, versus if uh, you just came out of a lighted uh, environment. Okay, some quick things about reaction time. Expectations, again, just like I said, talked about vision. The speed with which you can react to something is dramatically different depending on how expected it is. So if it's highly expected, you can you can respond about twice as quickly uh, as if it's something that you don't expect. And in general, the weirder and the more unusual it is, the slower your reaction time is going to be. Um, oh, by the way, uh, this is another thing that, I, I hear from the you know these engineers and accident reconstruction folks. They'll they'll say, oh look, but on the New Jersey driving test, it says that you can react in 1.5 seconds, and, and that's just utterly absurd because again, like a, everything, it's going to be a normal distribution. But particularly if it's something unusual, your reaction is going to be a lot slower. Hmm. <laughs> uh. 
Uh, excuse me, I have a little tickle in my throat. Um, okay, and that's related to lab versus real world results of reaction time. There have been a lot of reaction time studies in, in, uh, in driving simulators and what have you, and the, the evidence consistently shows that people react a lot faster uh, in those simulators in lab conditions uh, where they know what to expect than in the real world. Another thing that really slows reaction time is ambiguity of the response. And the big thing here is the swerve versus stop uh, response. So if insofar as the, it's not obvious whether you ought to swerve or whether you ought to stop, it slows your reaction time as you, so to speak, are, are kind of vacillating between the two options. And then finally, uh, attention, you know, we, we know about cell phones. Anything that attracts your attention away from the driving task is going to slow your reaction time. One complication, though, is that good driving involves the distribution of attention. Uh, rather than looking just down the, directly down the road, a good driver is, is actually distributing his or her attention around the external mirrors and what have you, as well as looking down the road. Uh, which, but when there's that sudden stop in front of you, uh, it slows your action time. Um, okay, here's some quick examples to just kind of to talk about how things kind of unfold. Pedestrians at night, common kind of accident, people hitting pedestrians. There's a, a huge literature on this. It turns out that the average driver going the speed limit cannot see and respond quick enough to avoid a darkly clad pedestrian at night. Uh, the evidence is overwhelming. So, uh, the uh, if it's a if the situation is if that's the situation, um, and then you know the the thing that the person's always accused of is overdriving their headlights. Well, you're going too fast for conditions. And look here, right in the driver's license uh, test, the materials it says that you're not supposed to do that. Well, it turns out that you just can't see a darkly clad pedestrian at night in time in, until you get down to about 20 miles an hour. So whenever you're driving over about 20 miles an hour, uh, you're overdriving your headlights for that condition, whether you like it or not. Um, here's another one. Um, this is another common scenario of a car driving down the highway. Uh, there's been a previous accident or there's a truck backing out of a driveway at a weird angle, uh, and uh, it, it dramatically slows your action time. So the person comes up to something. So this is what the person sees, you know, this, this part of a truck at an angle, and you really have trouble kind of comprehending that you've, there's an obstacle and what it is and all that sort of thing. And so sometimes you find these strangely slow reaction times when it's an unusual situation, something that somebody maybe never saw before uh, in quite that that form. Um, here's another one. I talked about this, this business of looming. You come up behind, so to speak, this image. The speed with which this image grows is your own, only cue. And people, um, and, and they say, well, it, you know, again, in, in we get to the courtroom and, and they, they show the photograph and they say, but it was obvious this truck was there, right? And the answer is yes, it was obvious, but it wasn't obvious that it was stopped. And this is another unusual situation. And it's very difficult for, for a person on the highway, particularly at highway speeds, it's really difficult or impossible to see in time that it stopped and not moving. Um, uh, here's another one, another common scenario, and this is that particularly under foggy uh, uh, conditions, is that the drivers begin to use the taillights of the leading car as a guide for where the, the, the lane is. And so uh, the scenario is the car stops on the shoulder and starts looking at the map or what have you, and uh, a driver come, comes along, sees the taillights, aims for them, and because of the looming business I just discussed, doesn't recognize that it stopped in time, and boom, you've got a rear-end collision. Um, here's another common one, and this is this is the uh, stop versus swerve. So you're coming along, 
And here's the problem. You don't see that the truck is stopped until the last second. And you recognize that you can't stop in time. So you reflexively swerve. The swerve versus stop uh, uh, ambiguity may have already slowed your reaction in time. And you swing into the other lane and, boom, have a head-on collision. Uh, okay, so just a, a quick, uh, I think I'm more or less uh, on track here, just a real quick, some things to be skeptical of with human factors experts. I, I'm skeptical of myself. Of I've heard some pretty um, interesting things before that experts have said. Uh, and uh, these are things that I, I think you should be skeptical of, a deep analysis of what's going on in the person's mind. We don't do that we don't know how to do that if somebody claims that they're such an expert then your eyebrows should be raised uh, next a focus on what somebody should have done we're experts on what people do we're not experts on what people should have done uh, another is a proposed explanation without affirmative evidence and this is the good example is this paying attention business uh, should be one should be skeptical of. And here's another one, an overly precise reconstruction of what took place. You know, that the, when the, the claim uh, that, well, uh, if the person, uh, that what, where they should have ended up was exactly here, you know, under these circumstances uh, and, and what have you, there are just too many variables and there's too much variation between uh, on all kinds of dimensions to be able to uh, to present to, to be able to um, predict everything with perfect precision when people claim to be able to do that I, they um, that should be looked at skeptically in my opinion um, so that's it and I did as Matt asked save a few minutes for questions so I'm happy to hey, excellent uh, thank you we do have a couple of questions sure. here and uh, uh, we'll, we'll try to get to, to each and every one of them. Uh, Dr. Wilcox, there have been a couple of questions that have come in uh, during your presentation that uh, that ask about how human factors expert would fit into um, or, or work with uh, the other experts on an automobile accident case. Um, how do you uh, like to work with medical experts, engineering experts? Um, do you collaborate or do you like yeah. to kind of work separately? Yeah, we usually uh, we usually collaborate because there there will be um, there there often are technical issues that that I'm not able to determine, but that I kind of need for my analysis. One of the most uh, obvious ones is uh, braking distance. So I'm trying to figure out. Okay, I'm trying to back my way into the question of, of uh, how long. Uh, often this is a common scenario. Um, is uh, how long did it take the person to react once they initially saw the condition? And uh, so part of that whole reconstruction has to do with, well, uh, when did they put their brakes on and how long did it did, was the stopping distance once the brakes were engaged? So that's an example of something that most typically what one of the engineers will, or actually a reconstructionist will, Will will work out, uh, and uh, ditto the the medical the medical folks uh, will be figuring out various things from injuries, which obviously is not my my, my uh, uh, part of it. So yeah, it's usually a collaborative effort. Um, we depend upon each other's information to a certain extent, and to try to reconstruct one of these accidents. Uh, so that's 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 usually the way it works. Excellent, thank you. You. Uh, we have a question here that asks, um, how do you uh, how do you get going back to the pedestrian accidents? Um, how do you get in proof on a driver not seeing a pedestrian if they're going over a certain speed? And the speed listed here is 20 miles an hour. But can you kind of walk through um, the the reasoning for why pedestrians are hard to see and if if there's a speed sure. cut off on that? Yep. Thing? Yeah, so the, the key thing here is that you've got to see the pedestrian in time uh, to stop, okay? And, and now let, let's, let's assume that you can't swerve. Swerving is different, but uh, just as for purposes of discussion, I'll assume you have to stop, and that would be because 
for example, there's a there's a line of traffic in the in the lane uh, that keeps you from being able to swerve to your left. Okay, so you've got to see the pedestrian in time. Now, at what distance do you have to see that pedestrian in order to be able to stop before you hit them? And the answer is, is that well, it's really composed of two components. One is the the distance it takes to react, the reaction time. So you you see the pedestrian. Well, you you can't react instantaneously. But you can't step on the brake instantaneously. There's a time lag, and that's the so-called reaction time. So we've got to figure out what that is. And then we've got to figure out what the braking distance will be. So the engineer figures out the braking distance. I can figure out what the reaction time would be under a given set of circumstances. As I said before, not not a precise number, but a, a range that the literature says one should expect. So when I put those two things together, that is the braking distance and the distance traveled during the reaction time, uh, then I come up with a distance at which you have to be able to see the pedestrian in time to stop. Now, we've got empirical evidence about what distance, at what distance on, with normal headlights and so on you can see a pedestrian. So that's the other part of the of the puzzle. So I so I'll say you know the, at 45 miles per hour, assuming a, an average reaction time, let's say about a second and a half, uh, and a, and an average braking time. You know you work all that out and you say, well, you've got to see the person at 100 feet. So then I go to the literature, in which they've actually tested the. the and, and by the way, the the best study does this. Just has has a bunch of people, has them drive around at night, and uh, and then just uh, um, tell, asks them, tells them uh, to tell them when you can first see uh, pedestrians and aligns pedestrians uh, in the road, puts pedestrians in the road and, and so on. And uh, what they find, so, so now they, they actually empirically measured those distances. And it turns out that the empirically measured sight distance Distances are not great enough to stop in time until you get down to like 20 or 25 miles for, per hour, depending on how the person's dressed, how alert you are, um, whether you're informed to be looking for somebody, et cetera, et cetera. Whether they're in an intersection, because you tend to expect pedestrians more at intersections than between intersections, and so on. So that's how it plays out. Okay, we have uh, two more questions. Uh, one from Jeff here who asks, can individual characteristics increase or at least not decrease reaction time for a person who is under the influence of alcohol or drugs? Could you repeat that for me, Matt? There, that... Sure, sorry. Yeah, just, uh, just repeat the question. This from Jeff who asks, can uh -huh. individual characteristics increase or at least not decrease reaction time for a person who is under the influence of alcohol or drugs? Well, if you mean by individual characteristics, you mean like uh, um, age, uh, experience, uh, things like that. Um, th th they're, they're always going to, all of these things are going to roughly be additive. So if it's something like alcohol, um, a case like alcohol, then the alcohol is going to have an effect, and all of these other variables are also going to have effects, and they're going to roughly be additive. Um, if it means specifically experience with alcohol, can you, if you drink a lot, handle the same blood alcohol content better than somebody who doesn't? The answer is yes, you can. Okay, great. And our final question comes from Matthew, um, who, who, going back to your second to last slide, uh, says deposition questions are critical. Second to what last, does that mean uh, this one? Yes. Uh, okay. Uh, what uh -huh. resources would you recommend uh, an attorney keep on his or her desk um, to develop relevant deposition questions for these types of human factors experts? Oh boy. Uh, Boy, it, yeah, I mean, there's such a large literature and so many different kinds of things. I think it's going to be specific to the to the given case. But I, what I 
would propose is that the way to unmask such a fraud is because that's really what we're talking about um, is to ask very precise questions about how they made these calculations because and, and that's where I think you'll start the person will start getting defensive and, and it'll start revealing what what they're doing um, I, I hear all the time people claim that such and such such couldn't have happened that's the the the, the standard uh tactic uh, that I see over and over and over is people saying that the situation the 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 facts could not have happened as so and so said uh and uh and that that's often they're claiming a level of precision that just is not justifiable and, and that's where I would try to do kind of a get them to explain all of their calculations, and I think that'll start revealing that some of this is just completely phony. Great. Okay. Great. I don't see any other questions in the queue, uh, Dr. Wilcox. Would you like to make any concluding remarks? Well, just uh, I'd like to just thank everybody for uh, for joining the seminar. So. Excellent. Thank you for the uh, the time and effort that you put into the presentation. Uh, if you'd like to speak to Dr. Wilcox about a specific matter that you're working on, you can contact us here at PASA. Our number is 800-523-2319. As I said during the introduction, I will send out a link to the archive recording of this program uh, tomorrow. Uh, the archive recording will be posted in the TASA Knowledge Center. If you go to tassanet.com and click on the Knowledge Center uh, link, you'll be uh, taken right to, to the webinar section. Our next webinar for legal professionals, Three High Liability Problems in the Safe Management of Outdoor Concerts, Festivals, and Special Events will take place next Tuesday, March 12th at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. And if you have any follow-up questions or comments, uh, please feel free to email me. You'll get an email from me at about 3.30 today thanking you uh, for attending. You can respond to that. We do take all of your uh, comments under consideration, and they help us to produce better programs. Um, with that, I am going to end today's program. Again, thank you to Dr. Wilcox uh, for the time and the effort that you put into the presentation. And thank you uh, to all the attendees who took an hour out of your very busy schedule to spend with us. So thank you very much. Okay. Thanks a lot. Bye.